Welcome to the third season of That's So Second Millennium, the Catholic science podcast where we explore the fascinating borderlands between science and theology through realms of philosophy, human experience, and more. Welcome back to That's So Second Millennium, episode 104. In this episode, Bill and I start out talking about the Metis Data Science Boot Camp that I'm enrolled in. At the time of the recording, I have four weeks left. And so, of course, data science is one of those key things in modern society where we're dealing with the fact that we have so much data that we're collecting about one another, about the natural world. And so the question is becoming, what on earth are we going to do with it all? And it's a new enough topic that it's growing and mushrooming in all directions. So after some discussion of that, we talk about the specific uh, question, a specific scientific question we could apply it to. And that, that question coming from geology, uh, the question of what to call rocks, um, it's not an obvious uh, question. It's, it's something that has definitely grown up more or less by happenstance and, you know, sort of sociological trends over time. And so the question, now that we have so much data, what could we use it for? How could we address this question more constructively? And data science provides us at least a possible answer in that computers, which are, you know, of course, extensions of our own minds more than anything else, but they are able to keep track of things in a way that we even with pencil and paper, cannot, which of course pencil and paper is an extension of our own mind already. They allow us to look at what, you know, clustering. So there's, you know, the question of unsupervised classification, clustering. Where do, how do things naturally group? And so that gives us the potentially exciting possibility of addressing the question of nomenclature from the perspective of how does nature actually separating things? What groups does nature give us if we get to the point of sophistication? Uh, that we can actually see. So that's that's an exciting question in itself. We also discuss the application of data science to language and to topic modeling. It's called natural language processing. So that brings up, of course, that brings up closer to home and, and more into the realm of ethics. So this was a fairly unscripted conversation, uh, but uh, hopefully you enjoy it, and we'll talk again soon. Based on what you've already been learning uh, about informatics and, and all of that. Is there one takeaway point that you're already uh, kind of um, resonating with uh, that's applicable to the broad question we ask in our podcast, namely, uh, you know, uh, uh, science and values and the compatibility of them, the need for them to be compatible? That's an interesting trying to find a point of direct com comparison. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously it's like anything. It's a, it's a powerful set of tools and you need some sort of compass outside the tools themselves in order to determine how to use them properly. How to yes. use them, you know, in a way that benefits people or even yourself, really. Um, yeah, that, that the tools themselves don't provide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, um, and... Um... Uh, the the values part are not something that can be taught in a twelve week course. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's emphatically not what they're attempting to attempting to teach. I mean, there's a whole bunch that I mean, it's we're really it, it's you have to be ruthless with your focus in a, in something like this. Um, and so the the whole point there is value in the fact that we've been exposed to all these things, even if we don't learn how to use them particularly adroitly. Um, we know that that's an option. You know, you, we encounter a situation in six months, you know, three months, let's say, into a new position, and you realize, oh, I need to solve this type of problem. Oh, you know what? That was a tool that I didn't follow up on, but we talked about it at the boot camp. Then, in fact, uh -huh. you know, be able to follow up with people in the boot camp, you know, including some of them who actually use this tool and, you know, be able to ask some, some well, advice good. that way. Yeah. Yeah. It will be. But that, that has the potential to be very valuable from that respect. Yeah, yeah. And um, does it apply specifically to um, the natural sciences like geology in any particular it way? It can. It definitely can. I mean, certainly I got into this field because, you know, I was doing things in my role as a, you know, as a geologist, as a mineralogist, as a solid state chemist, essentially, um, that were just you know, crying out for the use of these sort of much, much more effective tools than what I was using on them. 
which is the case across a lot of, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of talking to people about this, but it's already a very recurrent theme. You know, somebody in a, like say Cummins, like say working for, you know, Cummins engines and in Columbus, Indiana. And they're talking, yeah, yeah, we, we just, we just, we just use and abuse Microsoft Excel. And it would be a lot better if we did some of this other stuff, <laughs> but that's what right. we're comfortable with. And so therefore that's what we do. And that's what, and that's what the people we're communicating with are comfortable with. And therefore that's what we still do. So one thing that I learned from uh, uh, Purdue is that um, now they've kind of um, uh, added on extra modules that perhaps are, you know, like a one year long set of uh, additional courses or whatever uh, that, plunge deeply into uh data science for engineers sure and um i think that that's the, that's what makes the difference people who don't take those extra modules are left with microsoft excel or but something. now there's all yeah. sorts of extraordinary database software that can yeah. handle what trillions of pieces of data and yeah, yeah, because that's a huge engineering problem. Because we have we have so much data that it outstrips even with the hardware that we have now, as sophisticated and powerful as that is. And so the the strategy of being able to deal with the data. I mean, so a fun one fundamental limitation is you can't load it all into memory. Like you can't put it all in your random access memory. <laughs> right. It's, it's right there to process. You literally can't do that. So that's yeah. a major task of things like SQL or MongoDB or many other database software is that they is that they can slice out, okay, I'm gonna just handle this piece of data at once. I'm just gonna handle this subset of it at once, process it, do something with it, and then put it back on the disk and then pull up this other slice and do it in a very efficient manner so huh. you can actually process it and, and ever get it done, ever get the task done. But at some point to do the best comprehensive job don't you actually have to have the 100% complete uh, database in front of you to uh, I mean, in see the full sense, context? In some sense, I mean, in, in a way, you, you have to have gone through all of it. You have to have let all of it inform your uh, conclusions. But I mean, you, you literally can't look at it all at once. Like you really right. literally can't. You're always processing a piece of it. That's a good point. Um, a processor, you know, a single processor is literally handling as far as I know, that's okay. This is an overstatement. I do know that this is an overstatement, but you know, it's, it's handling a bit at a time. It's handling a single computation at a time. It's just handling them individually very, very fast, but it's still handling one at a time. It's doing one yeah. thing at a time. Well, I, I want to hear you more kind of in a narrative uh, way, describe more, more of what you're taking out of this and how you're seeing it long-term. But let me ask you just one more question to help me understand. Uh, is there? Could you give an example of how uh, of how what you're learning might apply uh, hypothetically to either a, a geological circumstance or a regulatory circumstance or any other kind of scientific so, or policy? So one mm-hmm. one thing that's near and dear to my heart because I do have a at least somewhat of a philosophical bent and I care right. words a great deal, right? Um, So there is a perennial question in geology of what do we call things? What do we call rocks in particular? So there's a, there's a solution that we hammered out and, and things, you know, the, the nature of things is such that it was relatively easy to come to this definition. What's a mineral? So a mineral is fundamentally a given crystal structure pattern, a lattice, to use the technical term populated by a certain restricted range of atoms on the points of that lattice, which is what a lattice is, is a geometric rule for constructing, the, for arranging points where atoms can essentially live. Um, okay. So it's a combination of structure and composition. And nature itself sort of gives that to us in a way that you know, we, can, we can intellectually you know, digest and say, oh yeah, this thing is definitely, this is different than that thing over there. And that's it's clear we should it's it's clear we should use different names for them. Um, there's certainly I mean that's it's not completely tidy by any stretch, and there's lots of ways we could improve it. But there is at least something there. On the other hand, with rocks, 
Yeah. Or even just to restrict your focus to igneous rocks, rocks that were, you know, crystallized out of a melt. There was molten rock and then it solidified. Um, it is not clear at all where we should draw any of these lines. Really? And in the, in the mid 20th century, by that point, there had just like everybody who studied anything had come up with a new rock name for it. There was just a blizzard of rock names and that continued on into the sixties, seventies, maybe even in the eighties. And I think in the eighties, people finally said, we've got to thin the herd. Right. We've got to thin because we're all using contradictory language and it's just impossible. So they came up with a plan and that plan was to use basic chemistry to sort rocks out. You know, prior to that, a lot of systems had depended on mineralogy and that has the advantage that in 1895, when all you've got is a petrologic microscope and then the ability to do wet chemical analyses, which take forever, um, doing the minerals, like doing a point count of minerals. So, so literally, the old school, one of the, the probably the most prominent old-fashioned method of, of comparing rocks is to slice the rock, look at it under a microscope, identify how much quartz and how much alkali feldspar and how much plagioclase feldspar there is in it and then basically draw a triangle and so you to, and to, to find out where you're at in the triangle you literally have to do something like point counting which is to say i'm going to take my slice i'm going to move it a tenth of a millimeter over look at what minerals under the crosshairs there move it a tenth of a millimeter over look at what minerals under the crosshairs there and that was faster than wet chemical analyses because your alternative mm. if you wanted chemistry is to grind the rock up, dissolve it in something awful like, you know, aqua regia or hydrofluoric acid, and then decide and then do a, a lengthy chemical analysis to get exactly how much iron, exactly how much silicon, exactly how much potassium and so forth was in the rock. Um, after, after the war and the development of the what's called the electron microprobe, you began to get to the point where you could do chemical analyses faster than point counting on a microscope. So instead of classifying things by what mineral is in it, now it's easier to classify them by what its bulk chemistry is. So, this, so we, what we have now, what the state of the art is, what's internationally recognized today is basically you take the sodium and potassium content, add those up, and then compare it to the silica content, and you put it on this cute little two-dimensional graph, and there are all of these fields with all these goofy names, and you just see where it plots. And, and you get to call it something fun like phonolite or yeah. nephelinite or andesite or something like that and there's a whole bunch of names you know there's there's you know probably two dozen names or something on this diagram um, and, and, were, yeah and each of these has essentially its own kind of fingerprint a distinctive definitional graphic look yes and the thing about it is is that the points that define this because it's basically the scheme is defined by the intersection points so once you've once you've got the points down to connect the dots exercise to say, okay, you connect these four lines and you get the nephelinite field or the phonolite field or the mugerite field or something like that. And, and then that's, you know, why are those points exactly there? That's the problem. Does nature give us an exact reason to put that point there? Not really. <laughs> Not really. So yeah. that's a lengthy introduction to the uh, an answer to the question that you posed. So there's something in um, informatics in data science called clustering. Yeah. You take a big population of something that you have some kind of measurements of, and you look at where things just sort of naturally fall. So this project I was working on was using text to do exactly that. So I said right. jeepforum.com. Shout out to jeepforum.com, which has helped me keep my 1987 Jeep Wrangler running for 12 years to the uh -huh. degree it has. Um, what, it hasn't been great, but without jeepforum.com, it would have been a lot worse. So, uh -huh. um, and yes, I am very grateful for you letting me scrape your site um, so that I could do this project. But so, wait, so what I did was I, I used something called correlation. Shoot, what is CoreX? It's called CoreX is the algorithm, and I forget already what X stands for. It's, it's C-O-R-E-X, and C-O-R is correlation, and E-X is excellence, or it's not that. Um, extraction. I think it's correlation extraction is what it stands for. And so it's just an algorithm, and there are many such algorithms, but it's an algorithm to look for, okay, what words occur together? 
And so that's in an information science and a natural language processing sense, that's a topic. And so that's all I did was I looked for it and I simply said, find me 20 topics, bring me 20 topics. And it, uh -huh. did. And it did a really good job actually bringing me 20 topics for the most part. I'd say a good 15 out of the 20 at least were recognizably, oh, these are the posts where people are talking about lifting their Jeep, putting new springs on it and, you know, making it so that it's, it's better to go out on the trail and, you know, and put bigger tires on it and all that sort of thing. That's a topic. Right. Those words all occurred together. Here's the one where we're talking about massive catastrophic engine failure. That's a topic. In fact, it's one of the most prominent, maybe the most prominent topic. No, that's not true. Catastrophic engine failure, I think, was topic six. Topic zero was like, it was, it was more like my engine isn't running well and the electronics are confusing me, which they are very confusing. Um, and so I need help with that. I think that was the very most prominent topic on the whole list. So, okay, to bring it back to rocks, why did I bring this up? So that's an application of, broadly speaking, what we call clustering, which is to say, where do the data themselves turn out to tell us that we should um, look? What, what, what do the data themselves just gather themselves into? What, what are the clusters that naturally exist in the data? And so that, there's the potential... And I'm sure other people see it, but I haven't, I haven't, I've looked around a little bit for papers that would deal with this and haven't found them. But there's, I think in the future, there will be an answer to this question of where we should draw these lines and what we should call rocks. There may not even be a cute little diagram. And there will be, there has to be a cute little diagram because we need that. But the cute little diagram will be uh, a secondary feature and the reality will be something where we've done clustering. We've done a clustering analysis on as many rock compositions as we can possibly lay our hands on, subject to the very broad rule that they are, they used to be molten rock, as far as we can tell based on their texture. Throw all of that data into a hopper and use computers, which can think in 14 dimensions a lot more easily than we can, because um, they're not really thinking, they're just following rules and they don't have any problem following the rules off to, you know, large levels of abstraction because they don't know what they're doing anyway um it's it's handy sometimes not not having any self to know what oneself is doing uh that makes them very useful tools <laughs> that's food for uh, thought yeah 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 but uh yeah so then, then they can come back with an answer and and we can we can go to work visualizing it which is to say condensing that answer down into something where we can grab onto some of it with our own visual um ab ability to 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 intellectualize and you know understand things um and then we'll come back with like there are actual natural clusters and probably not three dozen of them even though the people you will claw these bizarre names you know mugerite and oceanite and hawaii you will claw them out of some people's cold dead fingers because people become extremely extremely attached to names like yeah. I've watched flame wars about mineral names because I'm a mineralogist and I spend more time on that side of the thing. But I I like literally like watching grown people just get so upset about there's a specific mineral. And if you call it Titanite or you call it Sphene in the wrong company, watch out. Hey, where? The acidic spittle will start flying. <laughs> uh Oh and it's just the nature of human it's just human nature and are there reasons other than just personal preference and habit that people adopt certain names or can there even be some either political or extra kind of um, oh, I mean, you know, pride factor or i mean all of these names I don't, th there's none of these names that's purely arbitrary. I mean, on, on the, on one hand, there is definitely always a, there's always a scientific reason. There's always some reason. So Mugerite is named after some region in Scotland. I'm pretty sure a lot of things are named after some region in Scotland because, you know, we that's speak a rock in, star, right? it's a rock star. Yes. Yeah, Scotland <laughs> is a rock. Um, it's, it's just got a lot of things, in, interesting things exposed there. And it's where, you know, English speaking geology, believe it or not, started in the British Isles. I did not know that. I did not know that. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, but yeah, so that, that, 
you know, so there's a ton of things that are named after regions in Scotland. Um, there's there's whole whole classes and families and concept clouds and things that are named after regions in Scotland, basically because of that. So yeah, but there but there can be to answer your question, you know, and it's related to that. There are you know patriotic <laughs> reasons, you know, people or people people get um, attached to certain. I'm trying to say. Um, people get attached to certain people. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, it yeah. might be my advisor or someone that I respect or like for whatever reason, good or bad, um, good, bad, or mostly indifferent. Um, and yeah, and I become sort of patriotically or, you know, attached in some other way to this particular mode of expression. And so I don't, and I don't want to see this name die because it memorializes something or really, I mean, I think a lot of it's just nostalgia. I mean, I can certainly, I mean, I can call the names Mujerite and Oceanite and Hawaiiite to mind so readily because they're useful in describing rocks in Hawaii. And I love Hawaii. That's what, you know, reading about the geology of Hawaii is what made me decide rather arbitrarily to, to study geology. And so that, you know, that harks back to a time in my life when I, you know, yeah, I had this beautiful thing that was, you know, speaking to me and, and convincing me to to spend a lot of my life on this. So when we when we finally do, I mean, the, the ideal, of course, is to bring together. It's not like those things are intrinsically bad, these sort of arbitrary connections. I mean, when we finally um, if we finally do what I'm suggesting, we probably will and find some fairly definitive. Answer that's, you know, that comes more from nature through this sort of clustering analysis yeah. you know what names will we give the clusters we're going to give them whatever name we're going it's going to be a mapping between whatever name from the you know the pre-existing uh stable of names the concept that was attached to it on a somewhat arbitrary basis whichever one happens to map most closely onto the cluster that exists in reality with a with a clearer view of reality it's because, of course, we've seen some of it so far. You know, it was it was not it was not named completely abstractly. It's just very complicated. Um, but uh, I'm still wondering about the. the uh, I, first of all, I like I like the uh, endeavor of uh, now applying that to uh, what we were talking about, as far as you know, kind of. Um, uh, big data as it refers to our general use of words or pairings of words, which is what you were do doing with your original word scraping, um, uh, uh, web scraping, uh, because uh, people... Uh, it was word are, scraping. Are that's that's actually very people. apt. <laughs> is, is it? Uh, yeah, the word scraping, it's it's not a word, it's not a term I've ever heard before, but in this case, it's extremely apt. It's a, Yeah, because that's what you were doing in a sense. And I think of... Um, you know, like there's a software, uh, or at least there's procedures with Google, like uh, Google Trends or Google Zeitgeist or whatever it's called, where, uh, you know, Google is keeping track of, you know, uh, uh, phrases, the most, the most commonly searched yeah. phrases. Yep. And that sounds a little bit like web scraping. Yeah, uh, I mean, they're, 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 since since they're not people are coming to them and entering that data so it's not web scraping per se but of course it's still the same concept of we want to make you know this information is out there and in fact in that case what makes it different from web scraping is it's already passing through our fingers yeah it's already passing through our uh, digital machines fingers and so we should we should use it we should hang on to it and again it's it's one of those things that it's kind of it's a natural what what do people actually want to know about what are they actually asking about yeah as opposed to as opposed to some more arbitrarily constructed single person's impression of what they might probably want to inevitably to some degree well they should want to look for this <laughs> yeah they should ask it in this way I have so much trouble. I mean, over the over the two decades that Google has existed, um, and web searches in general, um, I've had so much trouble trying to because I just think differently than whoever or whatever has trained for so much of that time. I don't, and I don't really know how much better it's getting. 
because of course I think in a very mid 20th century sort of way, I think <laughs> I express myself that way and uh, it doesn't like it. It do really doesn't like it. Huh. It doesn't give me the answers that I want. <laughs> Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Even when I'm pretty sure the answers are out there somewhere. My goodness. Well, and then, yeah, the whole other question, and it's kind of a, a part and parcel of what we're talking about, is that interplay between values and these these processes and, and these techniques. Um, uh, it, it, so often values come in uh, into the uh, the question asking process, uh, you know, what are we what are we trying to learn from the web scraping, uh, or from the findings of our particular exercise, and why do we want to find find these things out? Uh, are we trying to weaponize? Right. Are we trying to weaponize a piece of data? Are we trying to weaponize a certain phrase? Um, and I think that's happening more and more. Um, so that, that that's certainly be, yeah yeah there there's know? there's unquestionably I mean there's always a bright side to things and I'm yeah. you know for for as pessimistic person as I am I spend a lot of time you know trying to look on the bright side of things like you know just thinking about what is advertising right I mean in a lot of ways it's it's you know what's advertising what's sales. And it's so easy to start thinking about them as, I mean, they're exploitative. You know, people are trying to take advantage of other people. And unquestionably, that's true. I mean, that happens a lot. That is that is a major component of it. But on the other hand, it's one of those things that it exists for a legitimate reason. You know, there's, there are plenty of advertising situations where someone finds out something about a product that, you know, will actually help them do a legitimate thing feel legitimately need or at least you know satisfy a legitimate desire at a reasonable price then they take advantage of that opportunity then the world is better off for it it's just that that's not by no means always the case well it's all very interesting and i salute you for uh, pursuing it um and uh i must admit that uh, the big data uh both eludes me and uh, to some degree um, makes me trepidatious. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. And crowdsourcing is the same kind of crowdsourcing, uh, yes. Thing where you know uh, the wisdom of crowds, uh, right? Yeah. yeah, crowdsourcing it does it does wander off into what I think of as Andrew Greeley space, where I have read very little Andrew Greeley because I've read like. 20 pages into a couple of his books and then thrown them down in disgust because right. it seemed to me what he was saying was the church should simply crowdsource to, to coin a, you know, to use that phrase that we should, you know, the church should simply, you know, declare to be right. What, you know, the majority of her members declare to be right, which is not Christianity in any recognizable sense. Huh. I mean, the whole, the whole point of Christianity is that we need help and someone has come to help us. and we don't have the answers already on our own. Right. No, that, that's right. That's right. And uh, that's, that's the big issue now with uh, all of our uh, COVID um, distancing rules and, and lockdown rules. It seems as though there's, you know, there's new statistics and new data every day but there still seem to be some data that we just can't get. There seem to be some data that we oh, don't plenty. know whether we need or not, whether uh, how important it is relative to other data. Yeah. And then we don't know how to interpret it once we get it. Um, yeah. So the power of data is perhaps more limited than we even might have thought a few months ago. Uh, I, I, I think that I think the people who actually practice it, I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, it's I think big data is one of many, 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 many things in the world that if you don't know much about it, you just hear the name bandied about it sounds extremely scary. Yeah. And then once you get into it, you realize how you realize its limitations. And in fact, you can get to the point where you realize you you start to feel almost the opposite sense. It has nothing but limitations. Yeah. There's someone there's someone in the field. I forget her name. Um, should pro I should probably try to look it up and add it to the show notes. Um, but she she writes like she writes books, 
that yeah. basically make fun of the results of machine learning algorithms because really? <laughs> they're just they can be garbage in garbage out well that's right or they can even be reasonable stuff in processed by garbage rules and then it's still garbage out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah and I it can you get really strange things yeah 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 and, machine uh, learning poetry kind of... for example which exists and is hilarious huh. well it's um more power to you for studying it i will say that but um someone has to know someone has to do got... the to, to 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 use a Harry Potter metaphor, there must be you know you must study the dark arts to know how to defend yourself against the dark arts to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how many people are in your class? Um, it's somewhere in the mid twenties. Let me see. I think I think both of the last two projects. I think we lost a few people. Um, but the last two projects, I think we both had twenty three twenty three people. Yeah, twenty three people in this cohort. And and do you meet via Zoom or some yep. other stuff? Yeah, we meet via Zoom. I spend an awful lot of time on Zoom. Golly. I do that. I do this. Um, I do three meetings a week. The wow. meetings I used to go to in person. So I spend a lot of time on Zoom. Yeah. It's nice to uh it's nice to have the face to face sooner or later. Gosh, I hope so. Looking forward to that. In Indiana, it shouldn't be too difficult anymore. It's not so bad. It's opening up. It's opening yeah. up. We can go back to church now. Yeah, in fact, we're going to go to the 4 o'clock Mass at Holy Cross. Oh, yeah. Parish. So I do I do need to let, let you go here because it's 313 on May 23rd right now. Yeah, but um, I don't feel – I feel bad for the uh, the pastors who – you know, ninety percent of it has to be kind of uh, they're the they're the local cops enforcing the governor's rules, right? And the and the and the bishop's rules, yeah. But they can't fully enjoy what they went into the vocation to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? yeah, yeah. At least at this point, they're more administrators, but that's often been the case in recent years. Yeah. That's something, yeah. yet another well, thing that we could spend a whole episode talking about. Yeah, really. Yeah, we've already uh, touched on a couple. Are there other things that you'd like to talk about in the next few minutes? Um, Gosh, I kind of need to wrap it up right now myself. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of That So Second Millennium. TSSM's audio producer is Morgan Burkhardt. Our theme music, Igneous Grok, was composed and performed by Vin Marquardt. For my co-host, Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Geesting. Until next time.